and calorie restriction. But when we do it together, will we continue to lose our muscle? Well, that's the problem. So when I so I've been to two international meetings of the Calorie Restriction Society where they asked me to come talk, and one of the things is they they don't exercise. They will, will constantly try to encourage one another to get more exercise. But the thing is, exercise makes them hungry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as it does, <laughs> and it may, it makes it more difficult to keep the calorie restriction regime going. And one of the things, one of the nice studies is done by uh, a doctor, Luigi Fontana, is he compared people in the calorie restriction society with people who were lean because they were vegans or because they were very serious exercisers. And the di difference in the, the, the health metrics that he used were very, very small between those three groups. And for some of the things, for, for muscle mass, for instance, the, the exercisers were better. So, uh, so it's very, it would be very difficult to compare, to do exercise and calorie restriction. Now, it wouldn't be so difficult to combine exercise necessarily and intermittent fasting. In fact, I used to do that. Um, I, in college, I was a wrestler and uh, wrestlers are always trying to lose weight because if you can get to a lower weight class, you're a better wrestler. And so I would lose 10 kilos every year when it got to be wrestling season. Oh. And that wasn't easy for me to do. And sometimes I would fast for three days, no, no food, no water, nothing. And then no, I would wrestle. No and then water for three in. days? Yeah, this was, this was before I got into biology. So that was really stupid. You know, <laughs> I really, I didn't destroy my kidneys doing that, right? But then, yeah. then I could put on four kilos before my match because I'm so dehydrated and I drink water and I, I keep it. So that's at least possible. It wasn't a very pleasant existence, I have to say, but at least it, it, it's possible if you're motivated enough. Um, so I, I really do think that the intermittent fasting seems to have benefits. People seem to be able to do it. Um, and so I think there may, might be something major about maintaining health with the intermittent fasting certainly we'll know because there are enough people doing it now you know unofficially not as part of official studies um just like there are a lot of people taking metformin now not an official trial but at some point in the future we might say boy all those 80 year olds that have been doing intermittent fasting for the last 40 years they sure look good or all the people that have been on metformin for the last 40 years, they sure seem to be healthy uh, for their age. Um, I think we're more likely to learn something fundamental about human aging from these informal experiments, even though they're uncontrolled, but they're uncontrolled, but they can be long term. Whereas nobody is going to fund a controlled study of human diet that lasts 50 years you know, where you're randomly assigning one group to eat this, another group to eat that. Besides, it's humans. Just because you assign them to a task doesn't mean they're going to do it. You know, unlike mice, if I want my mice to eat a certain hours in a day, it, they have no choice to do it. If I tell my children, you can only eat between noon and set six o'clock, they might tell me that they're going to do it, but they're likely not going to. So humans are very bad experimental animals. <laughs> And you just mentioned about metformin. Right? Uh, yes. Some of our followers are curious about that. Some people hold that um, if an anti-aging treatment doesn't work on mice or other uh, model animals, let alone there will be effective in human, or for instance, after metformin's failure in the ITP, um, its life-expanding effects seem to have been completed completely navigate oh sorry. yeah i think yeah that's a, it's it's a very interesting thing because i'm wondering how many effective anti-aging treatments we're missing because they don't work in mice and we say ah they're not worth investigating in people but you're absolutely right the um the results with mice are much less promising than what we know about people. Now we haven't done, you know, the blind, double blind controlled experiment like we'd like to uh, in people, 
But at least from the epidemiology, there's a lot of promise in metformin. And the other thing that's nice about metformin is that it's inexpensive, so it's not something that only rich people can afford. And it also, because millions of people have taken it for decades, we know it doesn't have horrific side effects that we're going to discover 10 years from now. now some drugs we might, might look fine for the first two years, and in 10 years, find out all the people are getting stomach cancer that have been taking them. I mean, who knows? That's possible. But with metformin, enough people have taken it for long enough that we know exactly what the side effects are. And for most people, they're very mild and, and, and they go away after a while. Then how do you evaluate the experiment team? Do you think that it will have an optimistic future? I mean, the team? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we... I think we have a way to approach this, but I'm not 100% happy with what it is. So the way that we have tried to sell the metformin project is that you start it with older people who are in not very good health. The idea being over a fairly short term study, enough of the unhealthy people who are not on metformin will die and the people who are, or get more diseases and become clearly less healthy whereas the people on metformin will not die or develop as many diseases. Now, the nice thing about that study is it's a short-term study. You'll get a result, but what it won't tell you is what metformin will do for people who are already healthy, you know? And, and, and that's what most of us wanna start doing these things when we're still healthy, right? We don't wanna start these things, uh, you know, when we're, when we're ready for the old folks home. And what do you think um, about the upper limit of our life expectancy? Speaking um, of, we need to talk I, about- Yeah, years. I think I think around 100 years. I think that's about as well as we can do. Um, and that's about 20% longer than now, right? And the reason yeah. I say that is that's something that we've been able to achieve uh, many ways in the laboratory. And even though I think most of the things we're, disco we're discovering with laboratory animals will not be relevant to people, I think some of them will be. And so the fact that we've sort of regularly been able to extend laboratory animal life by 20% suggests to me that that's a reasonable expectation for us and then so if, but if life expectancy was a hundred years let's say there would be a number of people that lived into their 130s let's say 140s maybe as long as 150 um you know right now the oldest person that ever lived lived to be 122 yeah. and a half years and life expectancy is around 80 so that's about 50 percent more so if life expectancy were 100 then you'd think well maybe the oldest old would live to be 140 or 150. I think that's pretty much the limit unless we dramatically change our biology. And I, I don't expect that we will want to do that. I think we'll want to keep being human in some significant sense. Well, speaking you know, of- Downloading these... our brain onto a computer is a kind <laughs> of immortality that I don't think that many people would be interested in. Well, um, speaking of this um, ambitious upper limit of our life expectancy, we need to talk about your famous bet against against Dr. J. Oshin. Yes, so we've had a good time with this bet. You know, and this bet, arose, and the 150 was exactly the right. I, I don't think we appreciated a time at the time exactly what a good number that was and, and, and i'll tell you why i don't think that we're that anybody's going to reach 150 or get close to 150 as we just get better at treat diagnosing and conventional treatment of individual diseases you know i think we'll get a little better and we might gain a few more years at the upper limit but i think for somebody to live 150 years or for life expectancy to be 100 we're gonna to have to find some way to treat aging as if it were a disease. We're gonna to have to have some intervention that really works, some non 
standard medical thing. Um, a medication, discover something new about sleep, or who knows what it will be. Um, so that's why 150, I think, was a good number, because unless we can intervene in the aging process, I don't think we'll reach it. But if we can, then I don't think it's an impossible amount of life extension to get. It's 20%. You know, the difference between 122 and 150 is about 20%. And like I said, we've been able to do that many, many ways in laboratory animals. And I, I think that's, we'll probably eventually figure out how to do just as good in people. Well, 20 years have passed since that you first have the bat with him. Um, is there anything happen that will affect the results of this bat? Uh, know, yes. So research? I think that um, what Jay would say is well 20 years ago the oldest person that ever lived was 120 lived 122 years and now 20 years later the oldest person ever lived was 122 years there has been absolute and, and nobody's approached it since then so he's feeling very good uh, about that <laughs> i'm feeling very good because a number of the interventions that we're discovering increase longevity in mice, do a very good job even when they're started relatively late in life. And I don't think anybody expected that. Um, you know, with caloric restriction, the earlier you start it, the bigger the effect is. But there's not much of a difference in the longevity effect of rapamycin if you started young or you started middle age, even if you started old. And I don't know if you know about it, but my book, Methuselah Zoo, is being translated into Chinese. I didn't know if you knew that or not, but it should be available in Chinese before too long. Well, it, have it the, the Chinese version published now, or it's just- It's not, it's, it's just being translated right now. So, so my guess is it might be a year before it comes out in Chinese, but the yeah. fact is it's coming out. Yeah. We will be looking forward to the Chinese version of your book. To be published. Yeah, and, and when you get it, you'll have oh, to tell me. If buy one. Yeah, and you'll have to tell me if it's a good translation or not. It sounds like you've seen the English version. You'll have to tell me if it's a good translation. Well, no, only tell me if it's a good translation. If it's a bad translation, don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, um, then I will, uh, when the, the publishment of your book, of the Chinese version, both the Chinese version and the English version, uh, Will, will will come out. I will uh, buy two of them to our edits edits laboratory and Good. and read it. Um, maybe there will be other collaboration or the cooperation between you and uh, the publishment of your book and us. That that would be nice. That would be nice. Yes. I hope that if. We have opportunities, or if you trust us, we can assist the publishment of your book. That would be great. That would be great. This will be our honor to do that. Oh, let's continue. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> let's continue the interview. Well, in your opinion, what is the most promising anti-aging invention? I mean, drugs, rapamycin, metformin, or any uh, biological reprogramming or some other intervention or are the most prom promising I, one? I actually, the, the one that I have the most hope for is the blood transfusion. And also combining these things with the right lifestyles, with the right dietary and exercise regime. Because that's something that we really, it's hard for us to do in laboratory animals, right? We can. We can feed them drugs and see what happens, but it's harder for them us to feed them drugs and give them exercise and all the all the things that 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 humans could do. The reason that I think the blood transfusion is so promising is first of all, it makes sense biologically. I mean, the latest work in that suggests that it's not some magic substance in young blood that rejuvenates but it's getting rid of some bad stuff in old blood. 
that's the problem, which means that replacing blood every so is something that's easy enough for us to do. And because blood goes through, circulates through all the organs, and it picks up lots of damaged products from the organs, it makes sense that that sort of diluting out that damage periodically would would be would be helpful. Um, the reason I like that is that there's not obvious side effects. You know, we don't know yet what the, whether there'll be long term side effects of rapamycin. I mean, if, if just looking at the mouse data, uh, rapamycin is by far the most promising candidate by far, not, nothing even close. Uh, because not only does it so regularly make mice live longer, but it improves health in so many ways. Um, but the young blood, I really, I really like because th there's very little chance of there being sort of surprise side effects from it. And it makes sense that having less older blood in your body could be good for lots and lots of organs. So if I had to pick one thing that I think is the most promising right now, um, it would be that. Reprogramming, I think, is early. Uh, we'll see. Maybe that will turn out to be something. Um, are we going to find drugs that are better than rapamycin? And the, would rapamycin, is it going to have side effects that we don't know yet? These are a lot of questions. The thing that I love is that there's so much excitement in the field coming from so many directions, you know, drugs, reprogramming, dietary things, blood. Um, some of these things are going to turn out to work. And when that happens, you know, it's, 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 it's going to change everything about human life. It's going to, you know, our futures are going to look different to us. If we can have another 10 or 20 years of health, I think people will think about their careers differently. They'll think about having children differently. I think they'll think about pretty much everything differently. You know, we invented, at least in Europe, in the US, we invented retirement just 100 years ago. Before that, you know, people worked till they dropped, basically. Um, so that was a whole new phase of human life. And now we kind of take it for granted. So we might have another, we might invent something else, some other phase of life. Maybe what we think of as mid-career now, people say, I'm tired of doing that. I want to go back to school and study English literature and write novels for the second, you know, 60 years of my life. 